All right, welcome everyone to the November uh, SJAA Imaging SIG. Tonight we have a treat. We have Akersh Simha, who's going to uh, tell us about a project of his, uh, useful uh, to uh, visual observers, but uh, taken from technology related to us imagers. And just uh, I'll say a few sentences about Akersh. I met Akersh because uh, he uh, is a contributor to K-STARS. In fact, for one year, he ran the K-STARS project uh, right uh, before the current maintainer, Jossam uh, Mutlak, uh, started. Uh, Akarsh is uh, responsible for the fact that uh, K-STARS can render 100 million stars and uh, not fall apart, but uh, and do that uh, efficiently. I got a PhD uh, in physics uh, from UT, University of Texas, and uh, currently works as a software engineer in the Bay Area. So uh, without further ado, take it away, Akers. Thank you, hi. Um, so, uh, hi everyone. I'm sort of an outsider here because uh, I, I think those of you who follow TAC or elsewhere know that I'm a visual observer. Um, I do, I have dabbled in imaging, but I'm sort of, uh, it's, it's not as exciting to me as visual observing. Um, and I don't have the equipment uh, to take good images. Uh, I have done a little bit of astrophotography, so I know how to, you know, uh, stack and, uh, you know, to some degree, minimal processing and so on. So, uh, but I'm almost entirely an eye at the eyepiece person. Um, but the uh, where this all started, uh, let me just share my presentation so you're not looking at. Um, screen. Uh, so um, where this all started is, uh, I think seven or eight years ago, even before I guess the Celestron had a product out or anything, uh, one of my friends who was an imager, he said, look, we're, we're using plate solving heavily to point our telescopes. You should just be doing that with your visual scopes. And um, <laughs> I never, I never, thought about it seriously enough uh, until the pandemic hit and I had some spare time on my hands and so on. So I started saying, you know what? I have nothing else to do. Let me try and build this system. Uh, so this is essentially my pandemic project. Um, and it's it's still very prototypish, uh, but I'm uh, going to mostly focus on the technical ideas that went into this project. Uh, so the idea here, in, in a sentence is to try and use plate solving to point visual Dobsonian telescopes. Um, so, uh, so, so why do we need, why do I need to do something this complicated? Well, uh, clear dark weekend nights are precious and uh, you need everything for uh, visual astronomy to work out. And uh, there's the question of what do you enjoy? Do you enjoy finding objects? Do you enjoy observing them? Or do you enjoy both? Uh, for some people, there is a lot of joy in finding objects. And I am not one of them. Uh, I mostly enjoy observing objects. So why not automate the finding, right? Star hopping to me is a chore. And the less I need to star hop, if I have a machine star hop for me, I will be much happier. And in some sense, what plate solving is giving me is a way of centering the field that I want without me looking through the finder scope and trying to figure out star patterns, uh, but instead have the algorithms take care of that for me, right? Um, so that's my motivation. So if you look at how most visual observers point their telescopes, um, they are either doing manual star hopping um, or they're using encoders. Um, and, uh, encoders if are also known as digital setting circles. Basically, they're, uh, they're these tiny devices that use optics to be able to tell how much a shaft has rotated, right? And so if you mount one of these encoders on your altitude and zero it correctly, as you move your telescope in altitude, you'll be able, it, it's going to register uh, how much your mood your telescope, um, and I mean, uh, you probably know about encoders because they're inside your mounts, uh, your imaging mounts, and that's how you, your mount knows where it is. Uh, but in in the visual observing land, it's something that people retrofit on telescopes. Uh, when I bought this telescope, it had no encoders on it, and uh, for many years I thought I wanted to put encoders on it, but 
I didn't have the mechanical skills to do it. You need to uh, make a specific kind of shaft and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and after you do all of this and mount encoders on your telescope, um, you get okay pointing. You might hit an object within 15 to 20 arc minutes if you're lucky. Uh, at least this is my impression. I've not heavily used encoder systems. The one time I use them, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hit you right at the center. And if you want it to hit really accurately, you have to have your telescope leveled and you need to build a pointing model so that, um, so that it points correctly. I think this is a problem with imaging mounts as well, in some sense. Um, so, uh, so, the advantage with plate solving is in principle, you, you don't need to retrofit anything. It's just replacing your eye at the finder scope or at the eyepiece with, with a camera, right? Um, and in my prototype, I think I get great accuracy. Um, unfortunately, the demo that I recorded has problems. I, I think I know what the problems are. The accuracy there is not good, uh, uh, but, but in general, I've gotten uh, something like five arc minutes to 10 arc minutes pointing, and I believe it can be improved down to even, even more. Um, and uh, the ease of use is pretty good. Uh, and in my prototype, it's not very robust, uh, right? Uh, but I believe that if we take this idea and run with it for many years with you know many people trying out different things, we sh should be able to get a product that or a, a, an you know, a concept or whatever that beats encoders at what they do, which is some, some sort of a electronic finder scope that I can just mount on the top of a Dobsonian or like a visual telescope. And suddenly it gives me push to capabilities, right? Uh, without having to mount these encoders and build pointing models and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I, my dissatisfaction with encoders mostly comes from the fact that I'm usually observing ARP galaxies or uh, Higson groups and such things. And these things are tiny and very faint. And you know, when you center one of these ARP galaxies in an 18 inch telescope, which is what I have, uh, you, when you put your eye at the eyepiece, you usually see nothing. And you need to wait for your eye to adapt to the field and you know, gather enough signal or whatever uh, to start seeing things. So if my pointing is five to six arc minutes off, I still have to do a little bit of star hopping in the eyepiece because to find out where exactly this object is. Ideally, I would like it to be, you know, in the center of my eyepiece when I, when it, when the system tells me that it is. Um, and encoders are definitely not able to achieve this um, without a pointing model. And I think my prototype is also not able to achieve it, but I, I have hope that uh, with, with some more engineering, it'll, it'll get there. So that's the context for why I'm doing this. So like I said, the dream I have is that, you know, there might, there, there probably exists an electronic finder scope that somebody will build and you replace the existing finder scope on your telescope, you know, with, with this electronic finder scope and you, suddenly have push to capabilities. Your, your system should be able to tell you how to push your telescope to get to the object and where it's pointing. Um, and uh, yeah, the futuristic dream here is that it'll communicate over wireless uh, with your laptop or tablet or phone or whatever. So you, so you, you just mount this thing and you're good to go. Uh, you might know that Celestron actually has a product, um, but I, I believe that the, the visual version of that product uh, is, um, is, is not as accurate as I would like it to be. And it uses a phone to plate solve, which, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've never used it. So I'm not very sure of how exactly it works, but yeah. Um, so I think this group probably doesn't need to see this slide at all. Uh, you probably know what plate solving is, but in case there's somebody in the audience that doesn't, uh, it's essentially, uh, both the con uh, it's, it's this concept that was introduced in this paper, astrometry.net uh, by Dustin Lang and others. Uh, basically it's, a, it's this idea that given a photograph of any region of the sky, you should be able to tell me, um, give me a mapping from every pixel on that photograph uh, to the RA deck coordinates corresponding to that pixel. Uh, so, 
and they, they just didn't propose this idea or an algorithm, they actually implemented it. And so they have open source software uh, that can find the location, orientation, and scale of any picture of the sky. So once you have the location, orientation, and scale, you can map every pixel position to an RA deck uh, pair of coordinates. Uh, and um, out of curiosity, uh, the paper is out there. It does so by matching star patterns, uh, triangles, and quadrilaterals, and it compares them against the database. Uh, you can download the software. You can also try it online by uploading an image. And uh, you amateur astrophotographers are already using it heavily. Um, visual observers are not. So <laughs> that's what I hope to uh, change with, uh, with this prototype. Um, the other great thing about plate solving is it's never seen a false positive. Um, it might say, I don't know what to do this, with this field um, and bail out. But if it says that this field is so-and-so, uh, it's almost certainly right. And I've seen it jitter around, but not by much, right? So maybe like two or two arc minutes is uh, is how much jitter I've seen at most, and that's probably because of smudging of stars and things like that, and uh, lens modeling and whatever. Um, so I have a demo here. Uh, I think I will skip this because most of you are familiar. And if uh, if if somebody wants to see it, I'll uh, bring it back. Um, so. What's the system I'm trying to build um, in conception? So this is not my implementation, but uh, ideas on how we might um, bring plate solving to visual astronomy. Uh, just to go back, keep in this, keep in mind uh, that every 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 one of these visual telescopes has a finder scope uh, that's on it. I guess you can't see my finder scope; it's not mounted up there. But you've seen what a telescope with a finder scope is like, you know, people have a Telrad and a finder scope and such things. And uh, the idea here all through is that I'm trying to replace that finder scope with something electronic. Um, so uh, let's first talk about plate solving assisted go-to um, as used by you folks, imagers, right? Uh, you have the ability and the stability of tracking to put um, to put your camera in your main prime focus or whatever and take pictures through your telescope. Um, so if you have, if you are working in that paradigm, you have go-to, you have great tracking, you have a stable mount, then what you can do is very simple. You take a picture, you uh, plate solve it, and you find the plate uh, coordinates, uh, the plate center coordinates. You have some target in mind, uh, let's say Orion Nebula or whatever, you know it's RA and deck from a catalog, uh, you find the error in the RA and deck, and if the error is uh, uh, larger than your tolerance, then that means you're not on the object, so you, then you correct the scope position. Uh, so this way, you don't need to build a pointing model if your scope's go-to doesn't hit, you can just use plate solving to fix it. And I believe KSTARS and ECOS already does this um, as part of uh, its routine go-to correction system. Um, and of course, if the error is within your tolerance, which might be a few arc minutes or even less, um, you know, you're done. You're on the object and you're, you have stable tracking, so it, it keeps tracking. Now, if the main telescope is a visual telescope like mine, uh, this is my telescope here, and you can see as I wiggle it that it's mount is anything but stable. Uh, these Dobsonians, if you try to do imaging with them, um, at best you're doing lucky imaging. Well, uh, I have tried to put, um, I have tried to put a planetary camera on this and take and do some lucky imaging. And it is a nightmare. I mean, I might shoot hundred frames and have three good frames, right? So uh, that's, that's how unstable these mounts are. Um, the track, the sort of quality of tracking used in visual astronomy, I track this with an equatorial platform. Um, <laughs> my platform is actually designed for 30 degrees north latitude. So actually I have eight degrees of polar alignment difference and I still use it. It works well enough for visual, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so uh, basically uh, uh, taking images through the main telescope is, uh, is, a, is a nightmare. Uh, plus, you also know that plate solving smaller fields is much harder because there are just so many smaller fields um, 
in the sky that you have to search through, your search space is much larger. So plate, plate solving wide field images is much faster. And uh, the focal length on an 18 inch telescope like this is uh, 2000 millimeters is my focal length. So uh, if I put a typical camera there, I'm going to have a 13 arc minute or a six arc minute field, depending on you know whether I have a Barlow or not. Um, and so it's, uh, it's going to take forever to solve those tiny fields as well. Um, so that's why the idea that I, I'm proposing is to plate solve through a finder scope. And this means that just like you as a visual observer would align uh, your finder scope, like center Jupiter or some bright object or bright star in your main telescope and align the finder scope so that it's, uh, you know. So you need to also align the finder scope even if it has a camera in it, right? Uh, the best part is that this alignment doesn't actually, you don't actually need to optically align the finder scope with the main telescope. So one of the main ideas here is that uh, if, if you figure out what is the degree of misalignment between your finder scope and your main telescope, you just memorize that misalignment and apply that every time you're done. You don't actually need to physically and optically align the finder scope. So I have a one star alignment process, which works as follows. I center a known star in the main telescope, and then I plate solve through the finder scope. The plate, the plate solving algorithm tells me, here's the center coordinates of my plate. This is the R and deck, but I know which star I have centered. So I know the actual R and deck in my main telescope. Uh, so I just, ask the, you know, I just compute with the plate solution that I have found, uh, what is the pixel offset on the plate X comma Y uh, corresponding to the star that is centered in the telescope. So the, here's a graphic that in, uh, introduce, uh, that, that explains this. Um, so the optic axis of the finder scope is pointing somewhere. It's not aligned with the main telescope. That's the center of this plate. Uh, the actual star that I've aligned in the finder scope is at some offset X comma Y, and my one star alignment procedure essentially memorize that, that offset. Uh, so if you're working with digital setting circles, which is another word for encoders, you actually need to align two stars or three stars. So even the alignment process here is simpler. You just need to align one star. Um, okay, yeah, and I, like I said, no need to optically align the finder scope in the main telescope. Uh, if, if this confuses you, uh, think of it this way, that if you think about the telescope axis and finder scope axis as vectors, then uh, the difference in those two vectors, which is the offset, that rotates rigidly with your telescope system, assuming that there's no flexion in your telescope system and so on. You know, uh, assuming that everything rotates rigidly, this offset is going, to be, is going to remain fixed no matter where you point the telescope, right? Um, so, uh, so that's why just knowing this offset is good enough. Okay, so how does plate solving work if you're trying to position a visual telescope by plate solving through the finder scope? Um, so by, by the way, just to give you context, my finder scope is uh, 270 millimeters in focal length. Uh, and with my uh, ZWO ASI 290MC camera, uh, which is overkill for this purpose, but I, this is the camera I had, um, I get a field of view of about one and a half degrees. Uh, so that's how wide my fields are, field is. And if I'm uh, not tracking properly for a few seconds, um, you know, it, it really doesn't matter for, uh, for what I'm doing here. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, that's just to set up how the finder scope addresses the problems that I mentioned with plate solving through the actual main telescope. Uh, so anyway, so how does plate solving through a finder scope work? It's very similar to the previous flow chart I showed. Um, you take a picture through the finder scope now, uh, you plate solve it, uh, and you compute the RA deck coordinates corresponding to the plate coordinates that you memorized X comma Y during the alignment process. You don't look up the center coordinates, instead you look at those offset coordinates. And then you ask how different is that from the target RA deck, you get a you know offset in RA and an offset in deck, and if we are not you know, within tolerance, then, then we correct the scope position. This is now assuming that you have a go-to. Uh, I guess this is similar if you would like to conceive of something, uh, it's like the Celestron product that is meant for Celestron mounts. I don't know what it's called, 
uh, I think it's part of, it's one of the incarnations of their star sense system, which is a small finder scope that sits on top of your telescope and guides your celestron mount. Um, uh, so it's sort of like that. And uh, you have to do a one star alignment even there um, uh, to bring, to, uh, to, to compute this offset. Uh, I, I did not look at Celestron system to do this, by the way. I've, I've still not studied Celestron system. Uh, okay, so now visual, visual astronomers have even more problems than this. We don't have go to a lot of us. So I track my telescope on an equatorial platform. Um, and if you don't know what an equatorial platform is, it's, it's a very uh, crude device that it, it's a platform for your telescope that tracks uh, the telescope for maybe an hour al along one axis. Um, and it, it does so by rocking the telescope around the pole. Uh, and yeah, and, and maybe you'll get an hour of tracking and then you reset it. So it's a, it's a tool that's used by a lot of visual observers to get tracking on their scopes. Uh, so I don't have go to, I have to push my telescope. Okay, so how do we adapt plate solving to push to? Uh, this is surprisingly a lot more complicated than you would imagine that it is. Um, so, in fact, we don't even really need to, uh, we need, we don't need go to or even tracking in principle. Uh, I still need tracking for my setup and uh, I don't think that's a, uh, I think that's a software limitation and not, uh, not an actual limitation. Um, but yeah, the sky drifts one arc minute in four seconds. And if, if, my, the positioning accuracy that I care about is one arc minute and my exposures are under four seconds, I don't even need tracking in principle, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, but in, in practice, I do need tracking because the plate solving algorithm doesn't like smudged stars in, in my prototype. Uh, but I believe that that can be solved. Um, and the limiting factor in error that I encounter seems to be flexure because I get much more than one arc minute. My exposures are two seconds and I get much more than an arc minute of error. Uh, so, so my limiting factor is almost certainly flexure and other, other things with this big cube not acting like a rigid body, right? Um, so, so that's not the problem. You don't need go to, you don't need tracking to do the plate solving part. Uh, the problem is that plate solving takes time. And the best I've managed with the entire stack so far is one solve per three seconds. That's about um, maybe, an min, uh, maybe a second and a half for the exposure, about half a second to transfer the data from the camera to my laptop, and about half a second to solve it. So the solving itself is extremely fast because I, I know it's scale hint. Uh, during the alignment process, I actually figure out what is the scale uh, arc second per pixel of my camera. And once I give the solver the scale, it's not doing a blind solve and that's extremely fast. Uh, so I can get a solve every three seconds or so, but for pushing a telescope, we need extremely fast feedback. We want, you know, 10 frames per second at least, right? So you know how you're moving. Uh, of course, if it's a motor and you say, oh, you're 15 degrees off, the motor, the encoders in the motor itself know what 15 degrees is, so you can, you can run the scope 15 degrees, but I have no sense for what 15 degrees is. So I want to be seeing some feedback saying I'm getting closer to my target or not. Um, and so I need faster feedback and plate solving. I mean, even if I bring down the exposure, bring down the processing, I don't know if I will actually get to the point where I can solve fast enough that I can just push my telescope with plate solving. So the solution I've come up with, and I suspect that Celestron does something very similar, uh, is to combine plate solving with something else that gives me fast feedback. And that is encoders or IMUs. And I'll explain what an IMU is. Um, now, I started this entire thing with the premise of avoiding encoders, right? And, and, and saying why I don't like encoders. Um, well, uh, there might still be advantages to adding plate solving to a telescope that already has encoders because you could bring the accuracy, uh, you know, you could increase the accuracy and uh, also avoid doing this two-star alignment because plate solving tells you where you are. So, you know, it has advantages, uh, but uh, I wanted to avoid encoders. So I went the IMU route. And uh, what is an IMU? 
uh, IMU stands for inertial motion units. These um, MEMS devices, microelectron uh, mechanical devices, these days they are everywhere. Uh, you know, they're in your phones, they're in your cars. Uh, they're, they're just pretty ubiquitous now. And uh, what they are is a three axis accelerometer, three axis gyroscope, and a three axis magnetometer, X, Y, and Z, basically three axes, uh, all combined into a chip. And uh, it, so uh, if, if you are a tinkerer who works with Arduinos, you can just buy this Arduino nine axis IMU shield, which is what I use. Uh, and it, it can give you approximate orientation. Uh, now, what these sensors are good at is they can sense changes in motion. Uh, they are very noisy. They are, uh, they are very inaccurate. Um, and people who have tried to use them to point their telescopes, uh, their threads on TSE and so on, the, they just don't really work very well. Maybe you'll get a degree or two degrees, uh, you'll be a degree or two degrees off, which is a complete deal breaker. Uh, so yeah, these, these devices are fast, they are cheap, they are small, but they only provide rough positioning. So that's the problem with them. But hey, they are fast. So that's good enough for me. You know, I can combine it with plate solving and get something that is accurate and fast because the fast comes from the IMUs and the accurate comes from the plate solving, right? So that's what I'm trying to do here. Yeah, so I already mentioned that combine plate solving, which is slow but accurate positioning with IMU output, which is fast but rough positioning, right? Um, but the caveat is now there are more things to align. Uh, the IMU has an X, Y, and Z axis that is printed on the circuit board, if you like, depending on how the chip is oriented. And now I have a problem. I have to figure out how to align this IMU with my telescope axis. So in some sense, there are three axes now, if you like. There's the telescope axis, not shown here. Uh, I've just marked an arrow. Uh, there's the finder scope axis. And then, then you can conceive of an IMU axis, even though Really, we should be talking about frames and not axes, but yeah. Um, I don't want to have the user try and align this IMU to arc minute accuracy with the finder scope axis. That's a deal breaker, right? So I must assume that the IMU is arbitrarily oriented with the telescope. Okay, so uh, there is that. So I need to find a transformation between the frame of the telescope, uh, or if you like the horizon north and uh, the, the frame of the earth or the observer uh, and the IMU frame. Uh, and there is, sorry, I meant the telescope frame and the IMU frame. So I, I need to find a transformation between those two. And the other problem with these sensors is that magnetic north is unreliable because they're going to use a magnetometer to find which way is north. And uh, that sort of is affected by all sorts of things. Even if I have a, like a metal object next to my telescope, uh, uh, next to the IMU, uh, if, I, if that metal happens to be iron and has a little bit of stray magnetic field, that can throw off its sense of north, right? And this is a problem that's very challenging to solve. And uh, the way I solve it is to assume that the north is unreliable. So I only think of, uh, I only use the IMU with an arbitrary azimuth offset. So that means I need to do two pieces of calibration. Uh, one, I need to figure out how my IMU is mounted on the telescope. And the second is I need to figure out which way is north uh, because the IMU is north is unreliable. Well, the great news is this does not add more manual alignment steps because we can use plate solving to keep calibrating these sensors. Like I, uh, like I mentioned, so uh, the algorithm there that I'm using is pretty involved, so I won't get into the details. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna show a caricature of it in, uh, in the coming slides. Yeah, like I said, lots of complicated math, but it's working. Um, so now, um, let me explain how I do the calibration. So there are two things to calibrate, which means I need two data points. Um, uh, with, with to calibrate the IMU uh, axis to the finder scope axis. Uh, so the first data point 
comes for free along with this one star alignment that I have to do between the telescope and the finder scope axis. So uh, the alignment procedure is as follows. I center a known star, I capture and solve through the finder scope. I compute this pixel offset x comma y based on the alignment stars that are in deck. And that gives me one calibration point uh, for it. Uh, sorry, it also gives me one calibration point for the IMU because I read the IMU at the same time. I know from uh, my uh, geographic location and time, what is the altas of my telescope because I know it's R and deck. And that gives me one calibration point for uh, the IMU. That tells me uh, one, piece of inf one piece of information amongst these two calibration informations that I need. The, the second thing, uh, the, the second alignment step is very simple. I just need to move the telescope, just literally move the telescope, right? And uh, once I move the telescope, uh, it triggers, uh, I have plate solving usually running in a loop. So it triggers a capture and solve and it, it computes the altas of my telescope. And I know what the IMU reading is. So I have the second calibration point just by moving my telescope. So the first calibration point tells me how the IMU is rotated with respect to the telescope axis. The second calibration point tells me which way is north uh, uh, in, in, in the IMU's frame of reference. And uh, from these two calibration points, I have, a I have a full way to map the IMU's output to the positioning of my telescope. Now, the thing is, this is unreliable. And I know this because these sensors drift over time. They have noise. They have all sorts of problems. And you know, the stray magnetic field can come and go and, and so on. So this calibration after keeps running in a loop. Every time I have a plate solve, I have new calibration data point and I can add it and recalibrate the IMU. So, so this, is, uh, this keeps happening. And every time I move the scope by a significant amount such that I can figure out north, I compute the new north and again, you know, recalibrate that. So both of these calibration steps are repeated every time they are possible. Okay, so that's the calibration and alignment. Uh, how does how do I use the system? Uh, so the way it works is uh, capture and solve runs in a loop. Um, and again, we pick up the RA and deck of uh, the, the scope position, which we know from the pixel offset. And uh, we calibrate the IMU in the process. This is, uh, I've gone over this a bunch of times. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to this pause image part in a moment. Um, but now, uh, what I do is because I have just recalibrated the IMU freshly at every plate solve, I'm able to use the fast, trust the IMU over short movements and or short periods of time and use the IMU to give guiding instructions in altitude and azimuth. How do I move my telescope? Basically pushing instructions to the user um, at 10 frames per second which was the initial proposal that I had, right? Um, and so now we have a servo in some sense where the user moves the telescope, the user is the actuator of the servo system and the IMU is what's reading the position of the telescope and uh, giving the user the error signal, right? So we have a fast servo that involves the IMU and we have a slow servo because every time the, uh, every time the scope is stationary, um, I'm able to take an exposure, make a plate solve and recalibrate the IMU and present a new offset to the user. So, so there's a slow but accurate servo and there's a fast but inaccurate servo. And the two work together to tell me how to push my telescope. So I get fast feedback from the IMU, uh, but the IMU is constantly corrected by the plate solve whenever possible. So this is the system. Um, uh, and, and right, and the, the problem the problem that comes up here is I am used, at least the ones I am using are not really sensitive to small movements and jerky movements. So once my offset is starting to look like this 0 0.0 degrees in, al uh, in altitude, 0.2 degrees in azimuth, uh, the IMU is sort of useless. So at this point, I want to present the user with something very intuitive on how to do this last mile. 
And the, the way I do that is that I have a, I have a display right next to my telescope here, uh, right next to my eyepiece. And with this display, I present the user with a correctly oriented uh, pause image. Pause is Palomar optic, Optical Sky Survey. It's digital, it's, it's DSS. You might know it as DSS. Uh, it's basically uh, there. Okay, you can think of it as this. There exists a software and a database that I can query, hey, give me a, a photograph of the sky around this RA and deck, and it'll do it, right? With, with, uh, with north orientation guaranteed. So uh, basically what I do is in that, display that's right next to my eyepiece is present a picture of what I'm expected to see in the eyepiece uh, from the digitized sky survey, correctly oriented. And that way the user can do the last mile in the eyepiece. So if I'm, let's say 0.2 degrees away, uh, you know, uh, that's much, that movement is much easily done with feedback at the eyepiece. So what I uh, show the user is something like this that says, hey, your object is six at six o'clock, uh, one field of view away. So you just move the telescope. This is very intuitive. You just move the telescope such that you bring the object from six o'clock to the center. And um, yeah, so the last mile is, is, is really straightforward um, uh, like this. And um, so that's the entire system. Uh, so it's a it's it's plate solving to calibrate the IMUs IMUs for fast feedback to get to the last mile and the last mile is an eyepiece with the reference image guiding you in, uh, in exactly which direction and where the object is, right? Um, so in practice, this system can uh, a, such a system can be built. In my opinion, it it, it I think all that is left is engineering work. Uh, and uh, so this is sort of my North Star system. Uh, and it'll have this sort of user installation where the user just removes their existing finder scope, puts in this electronic finder scope, which is fully integrated. It has its own computer running, plate solving like a Raspberry Pi or whatever. And they mount an HDMI tablet or a display uh, next to the eyepiece and connect wirelessly to the system. And uh, in, in, in the ideal user experience, you know, the, the combination of fast and slow loops are so seamless that uh, iterations are not needed. Right now, I actually need to iterate about four or five times to get to the object. So I'll move my telescope and then I'll wait, let go of it, wait for a plate solve and the plate solve tells, um, recalibrates my IMU. So my offset might be looking like 0.5 degrees. And then it'll say, hey, it's not 0.5 degrees. It's actually one degree because the IMU is drifted. And so I have to do about four or five iterations to narrow down on the object. I'm not doing any star hopping. I'm just letting the plate solving recalibrate my IMU. So uh, hopefully we can engineer a system where this doesn't, this is not necessary and the fast and slow loops calibrate so quickly that it's it, you don't need to like stop, wait and iterate. And uh, ideally, I think this is achievable. You, you want the object within two arc minutes of where the plate solving claims that it is. And uh, I think we can also have a situation where we can develop a pointing model. Uh, and that pointing model has much lesser of a task than it would if you were using encoders. Because with encoders, things like how level your scope is, how uh, well the axis is aligned with the actual axis of the telescope, these things matter, how solid your mount is. Whereas here in this system, all that matters is thermal drift and the flexure difference between the two optic axes, the one of the finder scope and of the telescope. So the, the pointing model here, assuming that thermal drift can be solved, it only has to learn flexion. And I think that's, uh, that. so I, I believe that you might be able to increase the model of this, uh, the, the accuracy of this pointing model with just a few data points. Okay, so here's where I'm at. I'm gonna show you a demo of my system that I recorded the last time I set up my scope. Um, un unfortunately, uh, the punchline of this demo is not great. And that was the only opportunity I had to record it. 
Uh, but I'll show it to you anyway. Um, uh, hi. Um, when I roll this clip, uh, uh, if, if you can hear uh, the audio and see the video, would you just give me a thumbs up? Um, let's see if I can full screen it. And yeah, there might be the flicker again, so I can't do much about it. This is, uh, yeah, we hear it. It's essentially a 17 millimeter Orion finders. Uh, Pretty quiet though. Uh, oh. Connected to a ZWO camera. Uh, we don't. I don't know how to fix that. Um, That's good. That's good. Is it is it okay? It was yeah, better. In your, in your sharing, if you select uh, optimize for um, for sharing audio through Zoom. Oh. Uh, okay. You can actually do that when you when you share at the bottom. There should be an option for you to select that, and then what it'll do is it'll pipe your systems audio into the feed into Zoom. Ah, you, oh, I see. So it doesn't do that otherwise. Okay. Um, so let's try this. Is is this better? This is. Uh... The electronic finder scope, better. it's okay, essentially great. a 17 millimeter Orion finders, uh, multi-use finder scope uh, connected to a ZWO camera. Uh, we don't really need a fancy camera like a ZWO. Uh, we could probably get away with um, a faster and smaller finder scope or lens and a, sim a simpler camera than, uh, than something that's used for uh, real astrophotography. Um, strapped to this finder scope is an uh, Arduino, which is a uh, microprocessor, uh, and uh, co it connected to the Arduino is a motion sensor, uh, the IMU shield um, for the Arduino. Um, we have this mess of wires going to my laptop uh, because uh, my prototype involving uh, the Raspberry Pi, which is a single board computer, um, did not quite work out uh, on the field. I need some re-engineering, uh, but uh, in principle, um, all of these wires could be eliminated except a few go into the secondary cage, which I'll talk about. And you could bo uh, mount a board computer right here. Uh, and of course you will need some way to power it. So there'll be some power supply wires. And now let's take a look at the secondary cage of my telescope. Um, Here's um, a seven inch LCD display that has been mounted. Um, currently it is showing nothing, but uh, it, uh, it's uh, red filtered and it has a touch panel overlay on top of the red filter. So you can still use it like it's a touch screen. Um, and um, an HDMI cable uh, runs down to my computer from here. Uh, this is to show, um, a reference image, uh, pause image uh, for uh, what I'm seeing in the eyepiece. And now, uh, I actually have uh, here a trackpad um, and uh, that trackpad can be eliminated. It's, uh, it's there because uh, I have a driver issue with multi-touch for the panel uh, that's on, pasted on top of this touch screen. Uh, if we used an AMOLED display, uh, which doesn't have a backlight, uh, like Ed Allen does on his uh, uh, telescope, then um, we should be able to just use the native touch screen of the display rather than uh, have all of these complicated uh, workarounds to red filter uh, a regular touch screen, LCD touch screen. My telescope rides on an equatorial platform, which is seen here as a black uh, item. Um, and and that makes the mathematics harder, uh, but unlike with DSCs, you do not need to re, um, re-align, re-perform a two-star alignment every time um, you reset your platform, um, uh, because because the only because the finder scope is attached to the telescope, so um, any offset uh, outside of that system doesn't affect. The performance of the system the, so the platform only complicates the math so i have currently um set up the software uh connected it to the uh, camera and other things um 
and centered alpha persei in uh, the telescope. So I'm going to, uh, once I have centered it, I'm just going to double check that it's centered. And then I come back and uh, hit align and I'm going to click this yes once I confirm that it's centered. I'm just going to push this dialog uh, onto the other uh, screen so that I can uh, see so, it up there. Uh, so now that I've centered alpha parsi, I'm going to go ahead and ask it to align. Um, so it's performing the one star alignment right now. And uh, we can come back to my computer screen. Um, and um, so... Um, Basically, it is, uh, it's plate solving right now, as we speak. Okay, so now that the alignment is complete, I'm going to enable the plate solve loop that I've described. Um, it's going to keep taking exposures and keep solving them. I've also set it up to target uh, M77 as, uh, as, as, as the object, and uh, it's resolved with my planetarium and set as the target. Now I'm going to go to my telescope. So you don't, you see, it's not yet giving me guiding instructions. That label that just says guide has no instructions on how to push my telescope as yet. And that's because the IMU calibration, remember, requires two data points. So I need to generate the second one by going to my telescope and moving it in altitude by about 10 degrees. You know, this is so that it can fix the magnetic, uh, magnetometer, uh, or so that it can fix north without uh, relying on the magnetometer. Uh, so now that it's uh, done that, you see it, it just takes another solve uh, and now I have guiding instructions. So all I needed to do to get that second calibration point was to move my telescope. So now, and he, uh, here's the part that uh, needs a lot of improvement, um, but there it's, it's possible to improve it. Um, I'm going to use uh, the IMUs to push my telescope. So I just brought my telescope into range. So as you see, as I move my telescope, these numbers are changing. So I, I just need to follow the instructions and uh, get them to as close to zero, zero as possible. So now with a few iterations, I've gotten close and uh, I then can do the last mile in the eyepiece. Uh, let me pick up my flashlight uh, oh. so if, as you can see in this display I'm not far um, the object is uh, just below uh, in my eyepiece field of view at like six o'clock uh, and remember this is oriented correctly and that circle actually does represent the FOV of my current eyepiece which is a six millimeter eyepiece on this telescope so I'm just going to bring it in from uh, six o'clock and there's the object uh, it's right there and now let me center it to show you that you know this uh, the solving is sensitive to that kind of difference so I have now centered it in my eyepiece and uh, once the solver hits again uh, it should show it pretty close to center yeah I think uh, that's the amount of error I have right now uh, what you're seeing so, uh, so I wish that, you know, I, I would have ha hit much closer to center, but I think I know what's going on. Um, I changed, um, I changed the sling that holds my primary mirror to what's called a glatter sling. And, uh, I think there's a problem where my mirror and collimation sort of shift every time I move the telescope around, uh, because it's on a platform. So the, uh, anyway, so basically my, I think I, I, I have a problem where my mirror is physically moving as I jerk the telescope, um, and it doesn't go back to center. So actually I'm losing collimation. This is, uh, because I have a sling mount, uh, and I think that's the primary source of that error, but. The error that you saw at the end, so you what, what you should have seen if we had perfect positioning is that that object M77 should have been right in the center of that display, in the center of that circle. Um, but the error that instead it was at the edge of the circle. So the error that's there was six arc minutes. And I am complaining vehemently about a six arc minute error uh, that is not due to flexure. So, uh, so I am very dissatisfied until I get it down to two hour minutes. So uh, that's where I'm at. Anyway, so, um, uh, 
So what I'd like to try next, and uh, I'm looking for suggestions and contributions, and this entire system is sort of uh, non-commercial. I don't plan to make anything out of it. I have to go through some bureaucracy with my employer to release the software as open source. So I can't share the code or the software yet, but I'm happy to share all the other ideas like you know, uh, hardware, mathematics. Yeah, just, uh, just ask for it. Um, so, uh, so the things that I'd like to try is transition to a shorter focal length. So I'm currently solving with a 270 millimeter uh, uh, focal length. And, uh, the, but the, the problem is that my limiting factor that is giving me that final error is flexion and imperfections in my mount uh, or imperfections in the way my telescope preserves alignment and not how many, uh, not the pixel size of my uh, image, right? Not, our, not the resolution of my imaging. Uh, so if I go to a shorter focal length, uh, I might be able to get away without tracking because the star smudging is not going to be detected by the algorithm. Um, and I might be able to get shorter exposure since brighter stars are likely available in this larger FOB that I will get. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of my friends who I've been talking to, uh, uh, Harshad, was the author of this uh, app called Sky, he reports five arc minutes accuracy with just a phone camera, uh, right? So um, it's pretty impressive, uh, you know, just with a phone camera to be able to get that kind of accuracy. And he's, he's worked on improving it even more. Uh, and he's, he's trying to build a product that, that'll work with his app. Um, so uh, the other thing I'd like to try is transition to a lighter and cheaper camera because uh, right now my finder scope system, let me just pull it out so I'm not talking in the air. Uh, so this is my finder scope. It's, uh, it's a typical imaging rig uh, attached to a finder scope. This thing you're has- still, You're still sharing your screen if you want to. Oh, oh, right. So maybe I'll just pause share for a moment. Um, how does it work? Yeah. Uh, can you see me now? Um, Okay, yeah, so this thing has a lot of flexure because this body of the camera and all of that is really heavy. Uh, so that's something I want to uh, move away from so that, um, so that there's not as much flexure. Um, and uh, another great thing is you, you probably use uh, ZW, some of you probably use ZWO ASI 290 cameras uh, for imaging. Uh, the same sensor that's in those, probably a lower quality run or whatever, uh, or lower quality electronics and stuff, the same IMX 290 or 291 sensors that are in those cameras are available for 35 uh, bucks on Alibaba or whatever. Uh, and uh, there, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a set of people uh, who run this global meteor network who are already using it to catch meteors at 25 frames per second. So they're just buying these $35 cameras and uh, creating all sky cameras that are, uh, that are catching meteors for them. And um, I was talking to um, uh, Peter, uh, I forget his last name. I was talking to a person named Peter from Albuquerque at uh, Okidex Star Party, which is where all of this video was shot. And he was telling me that, yeah, they're seeing pretty good uh, star density uh, with, with just this camera. So I want, I'm, very curious and I bought the board. I just haven't had the time to go and put it in and um, try it out. The other thing I wanna do is transition to a single board computer. Uh, so I already have my full plate solving stack running on uh, RPi 4B plus, uh, and it takes marginally longer to plate solve. And unfortunately my field test failed. And uh, I, I think it's the power supply stability issue. So I need to stabilize the power supply and uh, I, I also would like to eliminate as many wires as possible. So that's where I am, what I'd like to try next. And uh, that's pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, I'm open for questions, comments. I have a few extra slides with pictures in case somebody wants to see. Um, maybe I'll stop on this picture of the software UI. This is the uh, prototype software UI I built um, in Python uh, to orchestrate this entire process. Yeah, uh, that's... That's my talk. All right, thank you very much. Well, uh, questions, anybody?
Okay. I'm just curious about <clears throat> the algorithms, uh, Akash. In, yeah. When you do the diffusion of the information from uh, the fast loop with the one from this, the slow loop, mm -hmm. are you using by chance uh, Kalman filters? No, uh, that is a very interesting question. I should be using Kalman filters, but I'm not. Um, the reason is I haven't figured out how to use Kalman filters. So I, I don't have background in the in in that domain of uh, you know sort of uh, uh, probabilistic modeling or whatever you would call it. Um, I'd like to acquire background in it. One of the challenges is I built this entire system using quaternions, and if I were to write down uh, huh. how to do this sort of maximum likelihood estimate in terms of quaternions, uh, the math looked really complicated, right? Because uh, the 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 surface, if you like, on which I have to take derivatives is, um, this is getting into mathematical details that uh, might not be relevant, but it's the, the, the quaternions are equivalent to points on the surface of a three-dimensional sphere. So yep. the normal sphere that we know is, has a two-dimensional surface, but just imagine one extra dimension. So it's a three-dimensional sphere. The, the, the possible possibilities of rotations, which are quaternions, uh, lie on that sp space. And I, I don't know how to formulate this Kalman filter mathematics in that domain. And whatever literature I could find on it um, was too hard for me to understand. So right now I'm just recalibrating with no memory, right? Every time I get a point that where I can figure the orientation, I use that every time I get a point where I can also figure the magnetic knot, which is a, I need a big shift in altitude for that. Uh, uh, I, I just I just use it so it's it, they're, they're point estimates and they don't have any memory, and that's something I'd love to fix. I was wondering. Uh, I, one of my my previous hobby before astronomy was uh, uh, RC models, and I remember when when people started flying drones with Arduino, uh -huh. there was, many people used the common filtering using an IMU uh -huh. to get the, the raw data for uh, the essentially rotations and angles. Right and the uh, and from that, they do some form of dead reckoning to figure out where is the next the next position where your uh, your airplane will be. But given that that drifts over time and is not is uh, fast but not precise, every once in a while they correct it with GPS data, which is essentially the same thing that you are doing. But you are not, of course, based on GPS but based on plate solving. So maybe you can find a, some pre-cooked uh, code uh, in the Ardu Pilot community. That would be extremely helpful. So thanks for that. Um, I think it is, I mean, I want to say it might be, I don't know, honestly. So I know that GPS plus accelerometers is a very common steady problem. It's in fact, like uh, I was watching some video on Kalman filters and that was the example they gave. Yep. Uh, so uh, the, the problem with astronomy, I guess, is uh, it's, you don't have this sort of three-dimensional situation. Everything lies on the surface, if you like, of the celestial sphere, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, so you yeah. have a very different geometry. Yeah, um, yeah. Look, up, look up particle filters, Akers. Particle filters? Yeah, it's a sort of non-parametric relative um, where you, anyway, just look it up. Uh, you know, it's probably I, I, not appropriate for this sure to note that down because video. that's extremely useful, so particle filters. So yeah, I don't have any background in this domain. And that's one of the things I would really like to fix uh, is to use filters rather than point estimates. I was going to ask you about the display. You know, is, okay. is, is it possible to do a heads up, you know, like a display inside the eyepiece? Yes, uh, I, 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 we thought about that. Me and a friend brainstormed about it. I think, uh, I think it's extremely challenging. Um, so, so for example, you could in principle place something behind your secondary mirror that would illuminate, uh, but then you'd have to scale it uh, based on what IPs you're using. It would be really nice to have a heads up display, of course, but uh, the, and the second thing is, uh, yeah, you should have the ability to interchange IPs so that, that whatever you have, uh, uh, whatever display logic you have should be robust to that, which I think is extremely challenging. 
or you have to somehow place it inside every IPs, which um, gets sort of expensive <laughs> and impractical. So that's uh, that's sort of why uh, I, I and I think that that's way beyond my engineering abilities right now as a um, as somebody who's prototyping. Yeah. Uh, how, how about things? voice? How about um, audio? Like wearing an ear, uh, a white, you know, a uh, Bluetooth headset, and the thing somehow pinging you without being too annoying. Because uh, I would imagine that, don't you want to keep your eyes in the telescope while you're doing all this and while you're moving it around? And it seems to me like if you're moving away and looking at your display and then coming back, you're being- That's a good point. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. Uh, that could be useful. Yeah, I never thought about audio because, uh, yeah, that, that, that could be useful. Um, so, Right now, I haven't had any issues using the display because it's uh, like I mentioned in that video that I shot, uh, I put an actual plexiglass red filter on it. Uh, you know, uh, anything that in my experience, um, unless the display is very good at uh, doing a zero intensity black, right? Uh, any, if you don't put a plexiglass filter on the display and you're just using red gelatin or you're trying to use the display's internal settings or like digitally say that, you know, display only red pixels. Um, my experience is unless the display is very good, it's going to still leak a lot of white light that will hamper your adaptation. And um, so I went through this extra length to put this plexiglass uh, screen and now it doesn't bother my adaptation to look at that. So, uh, so I haven't had so much of a problem with it, but you're right. I, it's, it's much nicer uh, if I could just keep my eye in the IPs all through. Um, yeah, I'll think about that. Hey, Akash, this is Pavan. Yeah. Uh, so I have the night vision IPs. So I think that's probably much more related, relevant to the question, right? Because there is an electronic viewfinder there. And I'm wondering if that can be played solved, but I know it has its own circuitry and stuff, so. Yeah, perhaps, because then you, you might have control over that phosphor screen and you know yeah. uh, be able to decide what you display there. Yeah, maybe you could integrate a heads-up display into night vision eyepieces. I do not know if night vision eyepieces can transfer that image out to a computer though. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying plate solve in the actual eyepiece without having to deal with the finder scope. Uh, yeah, perhaps. Uh, Why can't you use a bino viewer? Uh, so that way you can split the image, put the uh, put the other one on the other side, and then you know sort of kind of play it solve that way. Yeah, the, the problem is uh, whatever I described earlier, right? The the stability of the tracking and of this mount, it's so shaky that you will have very smudge stars. That's the problem number one. Uh, problem number two, uh, unless the camera is extremely sensitive, which, you know, night vision devices are. So uh, that I think is a possibility. Um, the second problem though, is that solving tiny fields takes longer. So you have to make sure that it's not a blind solve. And even then um, you're just searching through more fields, deeper star indices. Um, one of the advantages that I have is, I don't know how, how much you've tinkered with plate solving, but uh, there are these huge index files that are based off various catalogs, right? Uh, one of the advantages that I have with uh, the wide field finder scope plate solving is, um, is I can load the entire index and hold it in memory. So it's in my cache. The very, f uh, the, the very f second time I hit plate solving, it's no longer reading from the SSD. It's just reading from memory. So that improves the speed of my solving. Uh, the problem with the large star indices is that you'll have to do something very clever. Uh, you'll have to use your IMU's position to figure out what is the rough R index, prefetch the indices so that they are in memory um, uh, corresponding to that R index, and then and then run the solve um, uh, so that it's more efficient. So I, I just feel that's that has its own share of complications. Of course, this finder scope method also has its own share of complications, which is flexure. And really, uh, and thermal drift, and I have really no proper way of modif uh, modeling those. But I think night vision IPs is an interesting idea. If you have a camera uh, that you can hook into your IPs that, uh, or into your focuser that has enough of a sensitivity that 
you can run very short exposure so none of this vibration matters and then you design um, the software such that it's it it doesn't do a blind solve but does it narrows the search space as well as possible i think then it might be possible so that's that's a good that's a good idea yeah i think you need both you need a bino viewer with uh Night vision IP is on one side. If you're so, you can still have interchangeable IPs on the other side. <laughs> exactly. That's that's really what I was trying to get at, right? So that way you have the camera monitored on one, and then you can change your IPs on the other. Yeah. And go. It's a very interesting idea. Yeah. All right. Any any more questions? I'm happy to entertain them. Okay. Well, if not, Akers, thank you so much. Sure, you're welcome. And, uh, it was a great Thanks for talk. giving me the platform. Well, it was wonderful to hear. It's impressive work. And uh, thanks a lot. And sure, um, thank hopefully, you. yeah, everyone say thanks. <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, see folks in December. Um, again, uh, like I said the last time, uh, we're looking for speakers. Uh, if you have something to uh, contribute, please volunteer. Uh, Francesco, did you have some or to say? No. Okay. Um, okay. Well, thanks very much. And that's the end of our uh, November meeting. And we'll see you all later. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>